Let us pray. Greater God, on this day of celebration, we come with joy and thanksgiving for the opportunities of study and research, for the blending of cultures and the sharing of experience and learning, and for family and friends who have supported us in the long journey towards our goals. Bless those who journey from here to their different places and countries of work, seeking a greater understanding of our world, its history and development, and its use of new technology for the benefit of all. Guide those who will use their knowledge, skill, and compassion to nurse the sick and care for the dying, those into whose healing hands we entrust bringing into the world the wondrous gift of new life. May blessing be upon all our graduates. May they find happiness in all that they seek to do, and may the world be enriched by their learning. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Always the most appropriate prayer. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning to you all, and welcome to this morning's graduation ceremony. I'm glad for a change at least it's dry and the sun is beginning to shine. It's going to be a wonderful morning's graduation ceremony, so I hope you all enjoy it. But before we start, it's my pleasure to ask the principal and vice chancellor, Sir Pete, and congratulations on his knighthood too. Thank you, Chancellor. And um, it is a, 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 always an emotional moment for me um, in graduation, and especially so uh, on this occasion. Um, uh, but it should be a celebration, I hope, for the whole university and the city, and certainly many of the responses that I've received from <coughs> around the city have very much reflected that, and that's really been very uh, important to me um, and uh, cemented my um, loyalty uh, and uh, pride in the university and the city. So Chancellor, Deputy Lord Provost, graduands, honorary graduands, ladies and gentlemen, let me add my very warm welcome <coughs> to those of the Chancellor, uh, to you all at what is the final day in a week of, uh, of celebration uh, of uh, your achievements. Um, <coughs> let me um, particularly welcome those who are visiting Dundee for the first time and to extend a very warm welcome to you on behalf of the city and the University of Dundee. We are now, of course, a UNESCO city of design, a status we share with Beijing, Berlin, and Buenos Aires, among others. That title was accorded to Dundee at the beginning of the year and is a sign of its emergence as a global city. I'm proud to say that the university is at the heart of these changes. We have a close relationship with the city, which goes beyond education to the sharing of knowledge and the building of partnerships, which have brought economic and cultural prosperity to our city. We're a founding partner of the BNA Museum of Design, Dundee, which is now beginning to take shape on the waterfront. We are the hub of a biotechnology sector, which accounts for 16% of the local economy. And we aim to be a key part of the city's future as a center for renewable energy promoting the sustainable use of global resources. Our strong and effective relationship with the National Health Service in Tayside and Fife consistently produces benefits for patients, not least those with diseases such as diabetes. No less than Sir Mark Wolpert, the UK government's chief scientific advisor, said of the city's contribution to diabetes care and prevention, if you live in Dundee and suffer from diabetes, you have been participating <coughs> in a medical revolution. <coughs> the ethos underpinning these activities is encapsulated in our core mission as a university to transform lives locally and globally by the creation, sharing, and application of knowledge. <coughs> the work we do here at Dundee has applications and implications for people around the world, 
not restricted to Scotland or the United Kingdom. And it's my privilege as principal of this university to see much of this work at first hand and witness the impact of it is having here in Dundee and around the world. To illustrate this, I'm going to share with you examples of our most recent work and its positive effects from here in Dundee to literally the other side of the world. Just recently, I received a rare visitor in my office. And you might think it strange that one of our staff, Professor Tony Martin, is rarely seen in Dundee. But that is because, as Professor of Animal Conservation, he has spent much of the last three years on the island of South Georgia in the Southern Ocean. South Georgia is a unique environment that supports an abundance of marine and terrestrial wildlife. And its population of seabirds was under threat of extinction from the presence of millions of rats, which were introduced to the island while it was a prime whaling station. Our habitat restoration project has been a huge effort to save those native birds from extinction, to increase their numbers by millions, and to restore the island to its status as one of the most important seabird sanctuaries in the world. Tony and his team have now cleared the island of all the rats, which means the native flora, fauna, and animal life of this fragile ecosystem can flourish once more. The challenges of this project have been immense. South Georgia has been the largest rodent eradication project the world has ever seen. And it seems remarkable to me that a university in the northeast of Scotland of modest size has achieved such a feat of logistics and prodigious effort, literally on the other side of the globe. More locally, around the same time, we welcomed hundreds of, of school children in Dundee to the university for the culmination of projects they've been working on to redesign the city's waterfront using the computer game Minecraft. The level of engagement with the project they displayed was remarkable. Primary six and primary seven children have been thinking about how their city could look. They are the future generations of this city of design, expressing their own creativity. I look forward to seeing whether the planners take forward their idea for a Dundee Eye or an underwater restaurant, and mine will be the first booking if that ever comes to, to pass. And then, just last week, we unveiled a research breakthrough that could change the lives of people across the developing world. A new compound created here in Dundee that may not only offer a treatment for malaria, but also may protect against future infection. And that has been made possible by the gathering at the university of world-leading expertise in drug discovery. We created our drug discovery unit to help meet the need for new drugs to treat what are termed neglected diseases. And a drug that eradicates malaria would change the lives of millions of people every year. That is what we mean when we say our mission is to transform lives. It's a mission that applies equally to our students and to our graduates here today. I hope you have experienced transformation through your time at Dundee, that you leave here equipped to face your own future challenges and achieve your ambitions. Each of you can have a significant impact on lives in Dundee, across the UK, and around the world, delivering tangible economic, social, and cultural benefits wherever you choose to work and to live. Our students are also a vital part of the community here on campus, one which has representatives from 145 countries. We're immensely proud that our students have, done, have voted Dundee the best student experience in Scotland for the past six years, and consistently among the best in the UK. And now, as graduates of Dundee, I hope you'll become our ambassadors to the world. We have a goal through our transformation agenda to become Scotland's leading university. We are already leading, not just in the UK, but internationally in much of the work we do. Our reputation as a center of excellence can only help you in your future lives. And I hope you will continue to watch and stay connected with us at the university as we go from strength to strength. 2017 will see us celebrating our 50th anniversary when I hope to welcome many of you and some of our 80,000 other alumni back to the city and the university campus. In the meantime, 
I wish you all well for the future and hope you will continue in your association with the university, taking pride in its success, as I will undoubtedly take pride in the achievements of each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Peach. Before we start the conferment of degrees ceremony, we have an important ceremony first to go through, which applies to all the graduates in nursing and midwifery. But if there are already graduates in the hall who are nurses or midwives and want to join in this ceremony, please feel free, feel, feel free to join. To do this, can I invite Vice Principal and Head of College of Medicine, Dentistry and Nursing, Professor John Connell. Chancellor, before the nursing and midwifery graduands are presented, I will ask them to assent to declaration that they will maintain traditional standards of professional conduct. Will the nursing and midwifery graduands please stand? I will read out the declaration and I will then ask you if you agree and I will hope to hear you say I do. I solemnly promise to use to the best of my knowledge and ability the art and science of my profession for the good of those under my care and to make the preservation and restoration of their health my constant aim. I shall keep secret anything I see or hear in my practice that should not be divulged. I shall constantly endeavour to improve my knowledge and skills within my profession and to share useful discoveries with my fellow practitioners whom I promise to hold in fraternal regard. These things I shall do for the benefit of those whom I seek to serve and for the honour of the profession that I now join. Do you make this promise? It's now my pleasure to ask uh, Deputy Principal and Dean of the School of Nursing, Midwifery, Professor Margaret Smith. Chancellor, I have the honour to present for the degree of Bachelor of Science, Stephen Hughes. <clears throat> Maria Porter. And for the Bachelor of Science in Midwifery, Anne Barnett. <clears throat> for the Bachelor of Science in Nursing, Leila Aiken. <clears throat> Judith Brinklow. Leslie Bryson, <laughs> Jennifer Burge, <laughs> Magella Burns, <laughs> Anna Dawson. Stacey Erskine, Lisa Gray, Thank 
Claire Hasty. <laughs> Catherine Heaney. <laughs> Kirsty McRae. <laughs> Mary Malone. Maura Moran, <laughs> Jane Nicholl, <laughs> Jenny Patillo, <laughs> Emily Ridley. Maria Waters, Erin Westwater, and for the Bachelor of Nursing, Teresa Suti, Lynn Wilson. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. And for the Diploma of Health Studies, Chloe Hain. Michelle Sutherland, for the Certificate of Health Studies, Lisa Lai, and for the Postgraduate Certificate in Advanced Practice, Meryl Lawrenson. For the Postgraduate Diploma in Advanced Practice, Noni Asusu Ohuba. <laughs> For the Master of Nursing, Cindy Punter. For the Master of Science, Safiya Abdul Majid. <laughs> Fiona Barry. <laughs> Lorraine Duncan. Sarah Gray, <laughs> Helen Keir, <laughs> Sinead Kelly, <laughs> Michelle Lyons. Joanna McEwen, <laughs> Ruth Parkinson, <laughs> Olivia Robertson, <laughs> Lorna Seaton. Eleanor Slaven.
Chancellor, I have the honour to present for the award of Doctor of Philosophy, Emma Burnett. Catherine Cunningham. Thank you, Professor Smith. My pleasure to call upon the Dean of the School of Computing, Professor Janet Hughes. Chancellor, I have the honour to present for the degree of Bachelor of Science with honours of the first class, David Burrell. <laughs> Thomas Butterworth. <laughs> Victor Chow. Alexander Grant. Jonathan Law. Emily MacDonald. Kevin McKenzie. Carrie McMahon, <laughs> Ewan Mount, <laughs> Jacob Steikens, <laughs> Guy Templeton. And with honours of the upper second class, Neil Archibald. Adam Brown. Graham Brown. Paul Cannings. Rory Duthie. Hamish Fenton. Mark Goddard. Todd Harding. And our school president, Steph Lee. Robert Mason. Rory McAlpine. Majed Monem. <laughs> Curtis Mulgrew. <laughs> Ron Schoenberg. <laughs> Mary Taylor. Jade Woodward. <laughs> and with honours of the lower second class, Hussein Al Nadaf. <laughs> Ms. 
Peter Armstrong. Palatu Ananda Dasa. Joel Robinson. John Toma. And for the Bachelor of Science, Sam Kalin. And for the Postgraduate Certificate in Data Science, Imran Hussein. Gordon Mayer. And for the Master of Science with Distinction, Christina Maniati. Mike McGee. Neil Samu. Ward Schruten. Kurt Zara. Ian Brown. Ronnie Dove. Gerald McNichol. Paul Dufert. Ian Elder. Kirsty Ryder. Thomas Seddon. I'm about to ask somebody to enlighten me. My pleasure to welcome Dr. Murray Frame from the School of Humanities. Chancellor, I have the honour to present for the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Lee Archibald. For the degree of Master of Arts with First Class Honours, Patrick Adamson. Neil Agnew. Daniel Bailey. Migle Blusevichuta. Adele Bradford Timlin. Nathan Breckenridge. Grace Brennan. Elizabeth Brooks Taylor. Joseph Buchanan Black. <laughs> Chloe Charalambus. 
Kyle Cuthbert. Hugh Downey. Maria Drummond. Joanne Elgood. Ailey Garvey. Christopher Gerrard. Fergus Henderson. Alexander Henry. Isabel Hermes. Samuel Hill. Callum Hodgson. Sean Howard. Erin Hughes. Edmund Jackson. Joe Jones. Francis Kelly. Harrison Kelly. Christian Langford. Philip Lyons. Eleanor Mackey. Dominic Marshall. Ruby Marshall. Kate McAuliffe. Helen McCabe. Amy McKee. Catherine McKnight. Andrew McMeekin. Finn Meehan. Josie Moore. Susanna Niskanen. Charlotte Orr. Callum Patterson. Mary Rutherford. William Saunders. Jonathan Scott. Callum Setterington. Juliet Shepherd. Megan Sinclair. David Smith. Lindsay Smith. Samuel Spaulding. Amy Stewart. Catherine Stribley. Talia Turowski. Suna Voss. Glenn Willis. Douglas Young. Dominic Younger. And with upper second class honours, Boris Axey. Alexander Alpin. Jacob Birkenal. 
Rachel Boynes. Lauren Brand. Kayla Brogan. Julia Brossard. Stephen Brown. Rebecca Brunning. Catherine Brunton. Christopher Burns. Alexander Cameron. Louise Campbell. Jade Carter. <laughs> Rebecca Clough. Adam Coates. Andrew Coates. Craig Collins. Jordan Cooper. Thomas Corder. Alan Cool. James Cooper. Johnny Crichton, Rachel Cunningham, Joanna Danskin, Bryn Dawes, Rhiannon Dempsey. Jonathan Dent. <laughs> Chloe Divers. <laughs> India Divers. <laughs> Cameron Doherty. <laughs> Alicia Dodds. Elizabeth Doherty. <laughs> Heather Doig. <laughs> Caroline Douglas. <laughs> Danielle Dre. Melissa Duffy. <laughs> Leah Farnan. <laughs> Lauren Findlay. <laughs> Oliver Fletcher. Alexander Foster. Andrew Fraser. Peter Fullilove. Vincent Gamaitany. Andrew Garner. Aileen Gilchrist. <laughs> Katie Gilgallan.
Sarah Gowland. Deborah Grahams. Joanne Grant. Laura Grant. Richard Hart. Amy Hurst. Ross Henderson. Anselm Henry. Rian Hill. Anki Huben. Magdalena Isoldova. Lena Yanchuta. Joseph Jenkins. Michael Johnston. Julian Joseph. Jonathan Keddy. Stephen Kennett. Robert Kilduff. Alexander Kizaykov. Plamen Kostadinov. Mattis Latsis. Kate Lackey. Kia Launanen. Michael Lawson. Shona Lean. <laughs> Diane Logan. Adam Lowry. <laughs> Lindsay McAllister. <laughs> Alicia McKenzie. Callum McLeod. <laughs> Robbie McMillan. <laughs> Katie McNaughton. <laughs> Laura Malin. <laughs> Loretta Matulevich. Connor McAleese. <laughs> Elizabeth McAllister. <laughs> Callum McAlpine. <laughs> Samuel McCabe. Daniel MacDonald. <laughs> Hannah McGregor. <laughs> Ryan Mackay. <laughs> Lauren McMillan. <laughs> Lee.
Lucy McPhail. Stuart McPherson. Sean McVean. Julia Morelli. Alexander Merton. Robert Middlemas. Marianne Mikhailova. Joshua Miller. Adam Mitchell. Caroline Mitchell. Fraser Mitchell. Kyle Mitchell. Mayalani Moyes. David Moreland. Marieka Muller. Callum Munro. Rachel Murdoch. Jack O'Brien. Catherine O'Donovan. Cameron Ogg. Sarah Parnell. Matthew Pavlitsen. Romy Petty. Laurie Petrie. Nathan Pickett. Amber Plumley. Justina Ragulita. Cameron Rathi. Stephanie Reed. Melissa Rickerby. Laura Roger. Lewis Ronaldson. Claire Ross. Lauren Russell. Ludmila Schmidt. Laura Scobie. Douglas Shillitoe. <laughs> Kenneth Spence. <laughs> Gareth Stubbs. <laughs> Stephen Tate. <laughs> Michael Taylor. Stephen Taylor. <laughs> Megan Thompson. <laughs> Colleen Turner. <laughs> 
Samuel Valence. <laughs> Alistair Vanit. <laughs> Rebecca Venters. <laughs> Simon Vickers. Greta Viltrakita. Amy Wood. Lewis Wotherspoon. Max Wyatt. And with lower second class honours, Luke Collins. <laughs> Zach Evans. Jordan Files. David Fraser. <laughs> Natasha French. Sarah Gibson. Monica Gowans. Esther Harmon. Erin Harvey. DUSA Honorary Secretary, Timothy hustler Rate. Claire Jones. Julie Kerrigan. Vladislav Kremenevsky. John Leburn. <laughs> Hannah Mackay. <laughs> Alistair McCluskey. <laughs> Dominic McLaughlin. Kira McCluskey. Eve McNamara. Jacqueline Morrison. Erin Mulhattan. Amy Napier. William Nimmo. <laughs> Laura Ramsey. <laughs> Joe Setch. <laughs> Rowan Shields. <laughs> Alexander Schilling. Ryan Smith. <laughs> Paulius Stankus. <laughs> Daniel Turkington. <laughs> and with third class honours, Kiriela Ranasinghe. For the degree of Master of Arts, Robert Hosking. <laughs> Gillian Payton.
Local Councillor John Alexander. John is not only a local councillor, but it is his birthday today. It is indeed. <laughs> There must be many more in the hall whose birthday it is also. So for, there you go. <laughs> so for all of them, let's sing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to If you don't want to be rugby tackled by Deputy Lord Provost, I suggest you go the other way. <laughs> Kyle Balfour. <laughs> Chelsea Cowie. Charlotte Gray. <laughs> Louise Malone. <laughs> Chancellor, it is with honour I present for the award of Master of Arts, awarded posthumously and collected today by his brother Thomas, Alex Nordquist. certificate, Alex's certificate. Thank you very much. And also we have a hood that he would have worn today for you and the family to keep reminding of Alex. Thank you very thank much. You. And I thank you. Thank you for coming here all the way from the United States today. I know your father, Robert, and your mother, Barbara, are also here today, and I thank them also for coming here today. We appreciate it very much. Our thoughts and prayers will always be with you and think about Alex. Alex, we know, loved Dundee. In fact, I know he wrote to your mother one time saying he will not return to the United States because he wanted to stay in Dundee, and he loved the university, and he was loved here by everybody. So thank you very much for coming today, Barbara, Robert, and Thomas. And Thomas, for the first time, has worn the kilt today. He's a fifth year student at New Jersey College yeah. and hopes after graduation to do dentistry. Yeah. So wish you luck and maybe you'll keep wearing the kilt all the time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Chancellor for the Diploma of Higher Education, Sarah McMaster. For the Certificate of Higher Education, Jill Brannan. Anthony Roncon. For the Postgraduate Certificate in Family and Local History, Catherine Onion. For the Postgraduate Diploma in Archives and Records Management, Shannon Elkins. Sarah Gibson. For the degree of Master of Letters, Graeme Reid. <laughs> Tracy Smith. <laughs> Lindsay Nairn. <laughs> Edward Ratcliffe. Hazel Stewart. And now for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Edwin Isiokafor. Ryan Lewis. <laughs> Julie Orr. Laura Patterson. Thank you, Dr. Frame, Principal. Chancellor, I have the honour to invite you to confer their degrees in absence upon the candidates who have been unable to attend this ceremony. By the authority of the Senate, I confer these degrees. Now, one of the very special things about a degree ceremony in Dundee um, is that we try very hard to combine the sort of pomp and circumstance and ceremonial aspects of such an occasion um, with a sense of celebration and joy. And um, the next part of the ceremony very much focuses on the latter. Because now, with your newfound responsibility as graduates of this university, I want you in a moment <coughs> to join together collectively to celebrate your success and also um, to thank all those who've helped you to get this far in your lives. The emphasis um, uh, in this, uh, uh, on, on this occasion is about decibels and not decorum. <coughs> Polite applause is not the order of the day, but cheering, whistling, and stamping of feet and any other way to make a lot of noise without destroying the hall uh, is acceptable. Um, the babies who've accompanied us during the, um, during the ceremony so far are encouraged to join in at this point. <laughs> and so, without further ado, congratulations to all of you.
I'm sorry to have to tell you, you were beaten by life sciences graduates. <laughs> and that's saying something. <laughs> well done. Thank you. My pleasure to call upon Professor Janet Hughes. Chancellor, I have the honour to present for the Chancellor's Award for Contribution to Teaching, Dr. Keith Edwards. As Chancellor, it's my pleasure to confer upon you the Chancellor's Award for Outstanding Contribution to Teaching and Learning. Thank you for doing so. Thank you for the generations of students that you taught so well and for the contribution you make to the university. Congratulations. Very good. Okay. Boy, he's so shy. <laughs> My pleasure to ask the principal to present the honorary graduate for the degree of Doctor of Laws. <clears throat> Chancellor, I have the honor to present for the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, Young Chang. Young Chang is truly deserving of the title Literary Superstar. Her books have been translated into more than 40 languages and sold more than 15 million copies. Among the many awards she has won are the UK Writers Guild Best Nonfiction, a book of the year in 1992 and in 1993. Young Chang first came to Dundee in 2011 to read from and discuss her work, including her phenomenally successful Wild Swans, Three Daughters of China. Wild Swans is a family history that spans a century, recounting the lives of three female generations in China. Three generations which bore witness to the most remarkable social, cultural, and political upheavals imaginable. First published in 1991, Wild Swans contains the biographies of her grandmother and her mother, then finally her own autobiography. The book won two awards, the 1992 NCR Book Award and the 1993 British Book of the Year. And it's been translated into 37 languages and sold over 13 million copies. Her appearance here drew a phenomenal response. The demand for tickets was such that we filled three overflow theaters to accommodate the audience who were enraptured by her powerful storytelling. Her own path to success was far from an easy one. She was brought up as a young red communist under the reign of Mao and was the first person to leave her province of Sichuan, uh, population 90 million, uh, for 30 years. She came to the UK to study, arriving in London during the era of punk and big hair, but felt immediately at home, despite still being controlled by strict rules such as having to wear the Mao suit of blue linen wherever she and her fellow students went. And she said of that experience, on my first day out, we went to Hyde Park and I just went mad with joy at the sight of the flowers, the trees, the grass, things that everyone in, 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 the, in Britain took for granted. In China, all our parks were derelict wastelands with just earth, all vandalized, and branches of trees broken off and desolate. It was no longer a crime to cultivate flowers, but there had been no program to rejuvenate the park, so they lay abandoned. So I just cried 
when I saw all the green spaces in London. Political upheaval in China meant the students stayed in the UK, sacrificing their family life for a new freedom. But it took her a long time to stop feeling scared that she might be sent back, and years passed before she could sleep properly. She has said that publishing of Wild Swans was when she finally got rid of the fear that had haunted her. Young Chang followed that phenomenal success with a groundbreaking biography of Mao Tse Tung, written with her husband, John Halliday, with more than a decade of research poured into it. They interviewed many of Mao's close circle and anyone outside China who had significant dealings with him, making it a truly startling and authoritative read. Young Chang returned to Dundee in 2014 to read from and discuss her third book, Empress Dowager uh, uh, Xi, 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 the concubine who launched modern China. Again, the response from the public here in Scotland was remarkable. Again, we had to accommodate more people than our lecture theatres could hold. Young Chang's books are still banned in China, but she is now able to return to the country on a regular basis. I'm proud to say that she has become a firm friend of the University of Dundee inspiring a new generation of students every time she visits and speaks, reminding us that you can overcome huge hurdles in life, move on and achieve greatness in your chosen field. Chancellor, I have the great honor to invite you to confer upon Young Zhang the degree of Doctor of Laws. Sorry, we give you too many instructions. <laughs> By the authority of the Senate, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws. Congratulations. Thank you. And welcome to the university. Thank you. Please. I feel extremely privileged to be given the honorary doctorate by the University of Dundee. I'd just like to say a few words about my own university life. And I was born and grew up in China. When I was 14 in 1966, all universities and schools in China were closed because Mao had said, the more books you read, the more stupid you become. Um, so books were burned across China. And I was exiled to the age of the Himalayas and worked as a peasant and as a barefoot doctor. A barefoot doctor was a doctor without any training. And then I became a steel worker and an electrician. Again, there was no training, so I had five electric shocks in one month. <laughs> and then after six or seven years, universities began to reopen. And I studied very hard, I fought very hard to get into Sichuan University to learn English. But in those days, China was completely isolated from the outside world, and um, even our teachers had never seen foreigners themselves. So our textbooks were direct translations of Chinese texts. And I remember the lesson greetings, because in those days when we bumped into each other, we always say, which means, where are you going? And have you eaten? So those were the English greetings I learned. And when I arrived in Britain, I used to go around and ask people where they were going and whether they had eaten. <laughs> and in 1978, after Mao had died, China's door began to open. And for the first time, scholarships for going abroad were awarded based on competitive academic examinations. I 
again worked very hard. I sat for a national exam. I did reasonably well. So I became, that's how I became the first person from one of the first people to come out of communist China to come to and study in the West. When I got my doctorate from the University of York, further south from here, I became the first person from communist China ever to get a doctorate from a British university. And always, I always rem remember the day I went to discuss my doctorate thesis with my supervisor, Professor LePage. I told him, you know, of all the linguistics, I, my subject was linguistics, linguistic theories, I like this one, I dislike that one, I think the third one was rubbish. And my professor listened, and then he said, now show me your thesis. And I said, but I haven't started writing it yet. And he said, but you had all the conclusions. And that simple remark, untied a knot that a totalitarian education system had fastened my brain. And he taught me to keep an open mind and to be free of prejudice. And uh, this has become the guide in my work in the subsequent years um, as a writer um, in my research. And, uh, it has brought me a degree of success. Now, I wish the same and the greater success to all the graduates here, um, as you have just accomplished your studies on this great educational system. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Brian Hoyle to introduce the next honorary graduate for the degree of Doctor of Laws. Chancellor, I have the honor to prevent, present for the degree of Doctor of Law honoris causa, Mr. William Forsyth. I'll try and make this quick and painless for you, Bill, but I am going to embarrass you while I try and convince everyone in the room I can read. Um, okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, graduates, Bill Forsyth, who stands in front of you, is perhaps Scotland's finest and most enduring, enduringly popular writer-director. For many filmgoers, Gregory's Girl and Local Hero, for which he respectively won the BAFTAs for Best Screenplay and Best Direction, are Scottish cinema. Indeed, I'm sure one of my colleagues won't mind me telling you, an American, they actually moved to Scotland after seeing Local Hero. His early films were also genuinely trailblazing. That sinking feeling, his 1979 debut, may in fact be the first truly indigenous Scottish feature film. And alongside the Bill Douglas trilogy, which preceded it by a few years, it was perhaps the first film that felt authentically Scottish. Indeed, the Glaswegian accents were so authentic that the film had to be redubbed for the American and English audience. <laughs> Although he is often quipped with typical modesty that he doesn't or he hasn't had a career, I think Bill Forsyth also stands as an inspiration to all the aspiring filmmakers out there. That sinking feeling, his first film, was made for a mere 5,000 pounds, a sum so small that it's earned a place in the Guinness Book of Records, I think it's still in there, as the least expensive feature film ever to get theatrical distribution. His subsequent Scottish films, Gregory's Girl, Local Hero, and the painfully underrated Comfort and Joy, were expensive only by the standards of his own debut, and were collectively made for less than the equivalent of five minutes of the last Transformers film. <laughs> Indeed, Bill's early films are proof that a modest budget does not equate to modest ambitions, and when, like so many other British filmmakers before him, he was lured to Hollywood, he proved beyond a, beyond a doubt that you could still make a film for 10 or even 20 million dollars that was thoughtful, intelligent, and complex. Indeed, at a time when American films were typically characterized by loud signposting and even louder explosions, Bill was making films that were defiantly quiet, subtle, and above all, personal. 
Whether you're watching one of his early films shot for a few quid with members of the Glasgow Youth Theatre or one of his multi-million dollar Hollywood movies starring the likes of Burt Reynolds or the late Robin Williams, you immediately know you are watching a Bill Forsyth film. Although there is something distinct about the way his camera is always in exactly the right place to build character and further the story, I think it's more than a matter of mere style or technique. Uh, rather, sorry, I'm going to make the ultimate compliment. Like Billy Wilder before him, Bill Forsyth seems suspicious of genre and easy classification. If his films are comedies, then they're particularly serious and even dark ones. But if they're dramas, they're unusually funny. Life, however, is rarely wholly joyous, wholly joyous or entirely miserable, and Forsyth films somehow manage to capture the full range of human emotions and com in all their complexity. Just think back, those of you who've seen it, those of you who haven't, go out and see them, to That Sinking Feeling and Gregory's Girl, and ask yourself if any films have better depicted the energy, enterprise, excitement, but also the melancholy, doubt, and confusion of being young as well as those two. There are also no heroes in Bill's films, just people, and they are always depicted with a warm acceptance of their eccentricities, flaws, and failures. It should come as no surprise to hear that Bill's mutilated magnum opus, Being Human, well, sorry, perhaps the most misunderstood film of the 1990s was called Being Human. And finally, on a personal note, I was very pleased to find that Bill the Man is clearly reflected in his movies. He is quiet, witty, warm, charming, but also dry, incisive, trenchant, and acerbic when the need arises. He's also a very self-effacing man in an industry giving over to self-publicity and self-promotion, but he loves cinema and he communicates this love brilliantly. The insights he shared while speaking to our students have given them, and indeed me, a great deal to think about, and I still do often, you know, something that Bill said comes up. Um, and I hope he will turn to Dundee and share more of these insights in the years to come. Chancellor, I have the honor to present for the degree of Doctors of Law, Mr. William Forsyth. By the authority of the Senate, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws. Congratulations Thank and you. welcome to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Your films are fantastic. Are you happy? Yes, thank you. Should we go to the stage? Yeah. 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 Well, firstly, I'd like to congratulate all of you here uh, today as you celebrate your triumphant completion of your studies. And second, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to ride piggyback on your genuine success by spending a few hours dressed up like this and masquerading as an academic achiever. <laughs> you lot have passed your exams, but you're looking at someone who, in a very real sense, has lived a truly unexamined life. That is, if you discount my two dodgy hires from 1963, <laughs> an English B and a C in geography. <laughs> it was music to my ears when I heard the geography teacher say that, uh, science, uh, that geography was the science of common sense, because then I just relaxed after that. <laughs> but I am part of the luckiest generation in the history of this country and the history of the United Kingdom. I'm an actual World War II baby boomer. And it's a truly blessed gen generation. I timed things badly in one respect. I was born just before the National Health Service really kicked in. So my mother still had to cough up two and six for Dr. Burnett to deliver me. That's about 20 pounds in modern money. But I ended up being the first person in the history of my family to be given even the chance of an education beyond the age of 15. I was in the very first intake of the very first fully comprehensive school in Glasgow, Knightswood Secondary. And of course, being a daft boy, I didn't take advantage of it. I didn't appreciate the gift that it was, and I didn't do my homework. Many of my friends at school did take the chance, and years afterwards, I remember when I was commuting up and down to London, I would bump into them occasionally on the shuttle. Uh, there was Alec, who ended up running a further education college in Glasgow. And my friend Andy, who played the violin in the Scottish National Orchestra. And Brian, a lecturer in psychology and also a world-class human rights campaigner. And a personal acquaintance of Nelson Mandela, eventually. So these were some of the 
my colleagues at Knightswood College of Knowledge. Um, I'm sorry there are no girls there. I, I didn't make it with any girls until long after. <laughs> I think it was the bro cream that put them off. Anyway, it's a lasting personal regret that I didn't seize with both hands the exact same learning opportunities that I had. Instead, at age 17, I ended up searching through the evening paper every Tuesday looking for any job going. I had surrendered my whole future to uh, Lady Luck. Thankfully, she did deliver in the Glasgow Evening Citizen in January 1964. There was one ad in the... In, in those days, you had a page for girls and a page for boys, for jobs. And there it was on the boys' page. It read, Youth Required for Film Production Company. Mary Hill. That's a district in Glasgow that you don't expect to find film production companies. <laughs> I had no interest in the whole, at all. I, didn't, I had no interest in cinema at all. But it looked better than the other jobs round about it, you know, for sweeper, upper, sweeper uppers and shipyards. So I survived two bouts of interviews and somehow got the job. Uh, some of the questions were quite tricky though. Can you handle a broom? Can you use a lawnmower? Can you wash a car? The last one was outside my comfort zone because my father didn't even have a car at that time. But the trickiest question of all was, why did you write your application letter in green ink? <laughs> now there's, there's a little historical social kind of uh, number of issues in there that we won't delve into today. <laughs> anyway, I'm sure that your attainments today, and I congratulate you again, We'll put all these banal questions uh, out of your ken. No one's going to ask you whether you can handle a broom to get a job. And thanks again for allowing me to bask in your glory for these few hours. Thank you very much. Pleasure to listen to the choir for a few minutes. Choir. Stem, bon, stem, bon, stem. Dry bones, now hear the word of the Lord. Stem, bone, stem, bone, stem. Dry bone, stem, bone, stem, bone, stem. Dry bone, stem, bone, stem, bone, stem. Dry bones, now hear the word of the Lord. be upstanding.
declare this academic ceremony closed. <laughs>